Xavier Lasada joins me this week from Spain to talk about craft breweries and big breweries. This is Beersmith Podcast number 241. This is Beersmith Podcast number 241, and it's early August 2021. Xavier Lasada joins me this week from Spain to talk about craft breweries versus big breweries. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for homebrewers and beer lovers. They offer access to video, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And also the Brew Commander, the new brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and gas propane models. The patent pending Brew Commander is a high quality brew house controller that offers automated step mashing, boil timers, precision temperature control, and advanced settings. Command your brew day with the new Brew Commander. To order yours today, visit BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. Finally, I'm happy to say that the new web based version of Beersmith is available at BeersmithRecipes.com. Beersmith for the Web lets you build, edit, and brew recipes from any brew browser, including your desktop, tablet, or mobile device. The new web version gives you access to tens of thousands of recipes, online recipe editing, advanced water tools, and much more from any device. You can try Beersmith Web for 30 days by going to beersmithrecipes.com. If you purchase a gold, platinum, or pro license, you get both the Beersmith Web and the desktop version for one low price. Existing members also get the web version for free if you've got a gold or higher membership. Check out BeersmithRecipes.com now and give Beersmith Web a try. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome Xavier Losada. Xavier is a chemical engineer who worked for 11 years as a technical manager at uh, Saverseria Polar, a Venezuelan brewery. He then moved to Madrid, Spain six years ago to find beer to found B Beer. Uh, Xavier, it's great to have you on the show. Welcome from B Beer in Madrid. How are you? Thank you, Brad. I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for having me here. And yeah, we've, we've been like, we are very positive about, about what's like coming in the co- next couple of months. I got my second shot yesterday of the vaccine. So we think it's going to start like seeing more tourism and yeah hopefully hopefully beer. things are starting to open up a little bit there now that people are getting the vaccine i hope yeah actually we're we started like two or three weeks ago seeing uh, more tourism so yeah awesome well um before we dive into b beer and i do want to talk about it let's talk about uh you spent something like 11 years at a brewery in venezuela and it was a large brewery. If I'm, I'm thinking, uh, you, you you said it's Polar, but um, yeah. uh, you know, kind of like a Miller or a Coors or a Budweiser here, right? They produce a lot of beer. Yeah, that's correct. Mainly lagers, and it was about 21 million hectoliters per year. Yeah, it's a it's a huge brewery. It it has four big locations around Venezuela, and it was like 85 percent of the market share of, of Venezuela. <laughs> Wow, so the main producer really uh, beer uh, in the country, right? Totally, yeah. So, uh, you know, they produced a lot of light lagers and malt beverages, I guess. Um, how were they affected by the craft beer revolution, or weren't they at all? Well, at first, I I didn't leave that part, right? It was like huge market, and for Venezuelan, it's not it's not that easy to find raw materials because. Well, everything's imported. We don't produce hops. We don't produce malt. So when when I like the, my last year, I remember like every time I travel in the country, I called by Instagram uh, like these small brewers, like, "Hey, I want to try your product," and I start buy, buying some some of these craft beers. But they were really, really, really small. Uh, they weren't affecting like this this brewery. Um, I think that when everything went a little bit worse in Venezuela and, and Polar, Polar is right now producing, I don't know, like 20% of their capacity, which is crazy. Wow. Uh, so now nowadays you can see like they're trying to do some like craft stuff, like to, to go for that niche. 
uh, what kinds of things did you do at Polar? Well, um, mainly I start mainly with all quality control. I went through water treatment, um, also like industrial services, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like steam, electricity. I, I was like a little bit all around. And at the end, I was in cost reduction, process improvement, and we were like, designing what to do with the raw materials because they were like or delay or we didn't have the money to like to bring at a time the raw materials so like like uh twisting the recipes mm -hmm. without affecting the quality but mm -hmm. like yeah the, like trying to produce the beer with what we had now, obviously, Venezuela went through some huge changes during the 11 years you were there. Um, so, what were yeah. some of, how did they uh, adjust, you know, how did the beer, how did the brewery adjust over that period of time? Well, I, I was like a lot of initiatives, like how we do better with less. It's, it, sometimes I think and I say like in Venezuela, we live what the world is going to live. I don't know, it's 50 or 100 years from now. Because we needed to like improve everything with less, with thinking out of the box all the time, like week after week, and it changed in, I, I would say like from two thousand and eight to or nine to two thousand fifteen when I left, it was you could see like the change almost weekly. That was that was crazy. And then obviously that uh, affected your decision to leave the country, right? As well, you were telling me that uh, you know at some point you just decided it was time to go. Yeah, like uh, my wife realized it first. Like, cause my my wife is my partner here in Bibir. She's like, uh, she's an expert in communications and marketing, and she she was traveling a lot around Venezuela, and she realized that hey, there's no way out of here. Uh, it's going worse and worse. And I was like really inspired in my work. I, I, I wasn't seeing it that bad. And then until I, I saw it. And yeah, we, we decided it was better for the family. I, I have three kids. We decided it was better to start again, uh, which is also a lie, right? Because you don't start again. Like you have a lot of things in your wallet and you start using them. Mm-hmm. So um, eventually you emigrated to Madrid uh, about six years ago, I believe. And, you know, what motivated you when you reached, uh, reached Madrid to, uh, to start consider opening your own brewery? Well, it was a couple of things. Like if I have to like, yeah, to, to enumerate them, it's one, it wasn't like a good craft beer scene here when we arrived. Every time we travel to the States, we were trying stuff and when we arrived here, it was like, as they, they did have craft beers, but it wasn't that good. And then it was only like, I don't know, five or 10, like you could try. And that, that was one of the motivations like, Hey, there's like, like opportunity here. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, like, as I told you, we are part of five. So saving, it start like consuming really fast so we needed to take like make a decision quite fast and faster than finding a job at the end because on the other hand like spain was like 25 percent on unemployment rate mm. and yeah it was like they sort of align and we saw a couple of uh new businesses around craft beer uh, so we, we start like, hey, why if, why can we do this? Let's start with, we actually, we start with this place you're seeing here mm -hmm. as a shop of uh, craft beers and cheeses. Interesting. So you, yeah. uh, so you mentioned you traveled to the United States for a short period. I guess you got uh, somewhat familiar with the craft beer industry here then, right? Yeah. And actually I was getting into in, in craft beer and into pairings also. I really like enjoy pairing. I do a lot of pairings here in in, in the bars in beer beer. Mm -hmm. And 
I, we started trying. Like every time we travel, I don't know. We, I've been like New York a little bit, so we try stuff there. We went to Miami also. We try stuff there. Um, I wasn't into as I am now because, yeah, I I was a lager guy, you know. Yeah. But yeah, it opened our minds. Like, hey, this is an entire world that and and in in polar being honest i would i wouldn't have my own beer you know with all the good things were that were happening at the time mm -hmm. so you started out uh you mentioned you started out originally just selling craft beer out of the shop uh, along with cheeses and then yeah. um were you brewing on your own were you home brewing at the time no i no i one of the things like filling three fridges having seven taps trying different stuff from around the world and and I, my knowledge was about in, in polar with raw materials that let's change this mouth uh, to this other mouth. Let's change this hub for these other hubs. Let's see what's happening with the fermentation rate. And so I was really into the process from this uh, engineering maybe point of view. Mm -hmm. So I sort of knew already how like how to interact with the raw materials without right. without brewing like my own beer so um yeah i started like trying stuff here at the bar and after four or five months of opening like my my brain with different styles i haven't tried ever like an sour you know yeah and i one day i came up with, with okay one of the things that we are proud of if we try to do different things, different recipes, mm -hmm. but that are very drinkable, not like uh, harsh or too too much. Uh, for instance, we have this, we start with this um, Mustard IPA. Mm -hmm. It's Coronel Mostaza was our first beer. It's a, like a West Coast IPA, but we dry hop with mustard seeds. And interesting mustard seeds yeah and it was really nice because one of the things i try to do is try not to find what I, what i want to brew if mm. i i don't know if i find a great coffee chocolate barrel aged stout like it's like amazing i will buy it and tap it in the bar not try to reproduce that right so you see so you have I, I guess you're still serving uh, other craft beers there as well right yeah, yeah yeah that's part of our spirit like to have different brewers breweries here from spain and yeah from everywhere else so how did the concept sort of a uh, behind b beer sort of evolve and and you know what's sort of your overriding theme there my own what sorry uh theme i meant uh, you yeah. know sort of the idea behind uh the brewery yeah it was like um like we love to conceptualize stuff like mm -hmm. it's not only the beer itself it's the story with the beer and behind the beer mm -hmm. and as as you see like in the wall he, here sorry uh, yeah i saw i saw some of it yeah yeah our beers are characters and we start with coronal mustard coronal mustard is like our ipa with mustard seeds and we write story about coronal mustard you will find it like website or in the bottle coral mustard has like specific music that he likes so we do <laughs> spotify playlists that we play in our bars mm -hmm. and so we, we start with that character and then we realize like this like that's the way we want to go like every beer is a character and has its own his own personality that's awesome and yeah it's really nice because people it, it it's happening quite often that someone cross the door or the door in the other bar and say, give me a Coronel Mustard. And someone that maybe I, I never, it's my, the first time I've seen. Right. So, which, which is amazing. That's wonderful for marketing, for branding. So how big is your brewery then? Uh, you, you obviously have a fairly small uh, bar there. I, you, you walked me around a little bit earlier. Yeah. But how, 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 how many, uh, how much are you brewing? How many liters are you brewing at a time? Yeah. Like I'm right now, uh, we were producing 1,000 liters per month. Mm -hmm. Then we opened the second location and, and we escalated to 2,500. Okay. And now, like right now, we, we with the two locations, we are back to 1,000. 
So your set, how big is your system? Is it a hundred no, liter, two hundred liter? I, yeah, sorry, I, I I think I didn't say this. We are Gipsy brewers. Like I design the recipes, go meet them, see like what they have, and and we produce in their like installations. Okay, so right you're now, you're using another craft brewery or somebody to yeah, help, yeah, make the beer. right now we're working with Malman, which has like one thousand two hundred tanks, and then two thousand five hundred tanks also. So uh, at this point, what beer styles do you offer and how do you go about selecting and developing your recipes? Well, the, at first, it, one of the really interesting things about having other beers here at B is like I started realizing that first you need to have different styles as a bar, right? We, right. we start all this experience as a bar, which, is, which was awesome because... I spoke a lot about reducing costs, about raw materials, about process, but five years ago was the first time I tap a keg and mm -hmm. I serve, you know? Yeah, your, after, your own beer, right? Yeah. No, and another beer. Like Okay, after, okay. After 11 years of being working in brewery, it was my first time tapping a keg and using, using like uh, a column and yeah, serving a beer. Sure. So that's one of the things I did learn about this process is like you cannot unplug from the client, from the customer. And that was really nice in this experience, like hearing directly from customer to customer what they like, what they don't like, what they're into. Certainly, so, uh, certainly an advantage if you're if you're in the tap room, right? Totally. Yeah, that, that's the thing. We started like, I don't know, a uh, classic styles. Lager, for sure, like for the people that doesn't like craft beer or, or not, not doesn't like craft beer, that one that keep like sort of what they knew before. A IPA, double, wheat beer, a sour. So we, we had like seven different styles tap in, in our bar. Mm -hmm. So what I did was start like designing recipes to change those tap for B beer taps. Right, so, so you, uh, yeah, I, I'm, la I'm looking right now. I think you got like seven on the board behind you, right? Yeah, correct. So yeah. are you still going with those same basics? Uh, it sounded like a couple Belgian styles, and then uh, an IPA, and uh, and so on. Yeah, totally. Like we now and then tap. It depends on like the season, right? But now and then we tap like uh, like stouts, or we try to have a sour almost all of the time, mm -hmm. and. Yeah, I, what I'm trying to say is like, even when IPAs is like the way to go in craft beer at first, uh, we don't tap like a bunch of IPAs. We try like to get more of the market that get more people interested. In yeah, craft a variety, beer. of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have some, you, know, you mentioned you're not a home brewer. Uh, do you have some kind of pilot system or how do you go about, you know, sort of developing and coming up with your new recipes? Uh, well, it's a mix of things. Like I first design the recipes like in paper. I then try like and see if I have like a very specific thing in mind. I try to see how does it react with the beers. So I I will have I would use like ten different beers from the market that I think they have like very nice, um, uh, very nice flavor profile. Know, yeah. Yeah, profile, flavor profile. That's what I was looking for. Thank you. And then, for instance, the mustard. I try boiling the mustard. What happens if I don't boil it? What happens if I make an infusion out of it? Then what happens if I only grind it and put it in the beer? So it's it's a, like a sort of a mini lab, but at the end, mm -hmm. we, we do take the risk like, like with 1,000 liters. Right, so you uh, so you kind of prototype it, I guess, at, at at your at your bar there, and then and then develop it up yeah. from there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, maybe it's been luck. Uh, out of twelve recipes, like all of those twelve recipes work, and and we also work with a great brewery. Like they are like almost our partners right now, and. I really trust them and they really trust me. So we sit and we talk about the recipes and, and we go and produce it. 
And you have two locations now is what I understand. So when did you expand into the second location? December 2019, we found like also in, we are in Madrid center. So yeah, we, it Perf was perfect timing, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally perfect timing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It was a, it is a great location. So we, we, we are totally into seeing going up again because this bar was totally packed and yeah, it was like the way to go. Like, okay, I, I started getting out of, of the bar. I started distributing and also my wife, like get out of the bar, try to find like client from tourist agencies, you know, and and yeah, we need to step back a little bit the last year. Like, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, so yeah. you're in, you're in central Madrid. You mentioned you rely a lot on tourism, right? Totally. About 50 percent. It was our share. Yeah. And obviously, uh, uh, it, you know, we were just talking about it, but COVID has had a significant impact on the beer. Uh, well, on everybody. Um, yeah. How have you guys managed and adapted to that? Well, it's. Uh, it's a matter of getting close to like the, the, the stakeholders, like all clients, um, like employees, the guy who's renting you the place, the bank, like we were like, okay, speaking every week. I was calling every week the, like, the owner of the, like the landlord, you know? And I think that's what, that's how we survive, like getting closer, everybody like, look, we are getting through this. Like, what can we do together? The same with the suppliers. Like, yeah, it's, I think it's a way to go. And, and it's funny because it's sort of what we were living in Venezuela 10 years ago already. Right. And it was that getting closer to suppliers, getting like the, team building, like getting people really close. And that's the way you can survive those episodes. Even yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned you cut, you cut your production in half and yet you're still uh, still, still surviving, obviously, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, yeah, cut. And, and I was looking at the numbers of the craft beer scene in Spain and it was around 0.6% of the market share, share, sorry, in 2016 when we started. And it achieved 1.1, 1 .1, almost double in 2019. Wow. And it's right now it's back to 2016. Hmm. What is, so, uh, yeah. so that was another question I had for you. What is the craft beer scene like in, in Spain? Is, uh, is everybody still drinking uh, light lagers or, or is, yeah, are they starting to make progress into other styles? There's something really weird here that people doesn't understand when they visit Madrid. People call, like, ask for a beer as a caña. Like, they go into a bar, they sit and say, give me a caña, give me a beer. They don't ask, what beer do you have? What's the style? What's the brand? Even with lagers, they say, give me a caña. So that, that, uh, that just, I assume that just means a light lager, right? In most cases? Yeah, I like, yeah, that's right. But they didn't even, like, ask for a specific brand. Right. It's like the generic. They ask for the generic. Give me a give me a lager. Yeah, give me a lager. And so they right now it changed. Like, well, we are surviving uh, without tourism, right? And yeah. and yeah, it's changed. Uh, it's above all like the younger uh, Spaniards that are traveling around the world. You know, like they are more open minded. Mm -hmm. And also, you have a lot of expats here. Right. So, yeah, it's I, I can tell that it changed at first. They like they look at the pricing and they were like, eh, that's that's really expensive. Right now, it's like it doesn't happen anymore. People like telling something about pricing. So they uh, so it is slowly making inroads, but you mentioned it's still one percent or something like that of the overall yeah, beer consumption. Crazy. So yeah. very, very small number even compared to here. Right. Yeah, it's very small number, but I think that's the opportunity. I think it's a market that's gonna grow. We need like to keep keep here and try to offer the best product we can. You know, like to people uh, getting motivated to to keep drinking craft beer. 
And what's your distribution? Are you primarily selling directly through your tap room or do you have uh, the ability to give kegs out to other people or, or perhaps bottle? Yeah, I have like right now it's very small our distribution. We are producing like 85% of our beers in kegs for our bars. Mm -hmm. And, but we have a couple of like really nice, good food places that you like serve our beer. And that's part of the plan. Like it, when it started racing again, I'm, I'm supposed to be out of the bar again and start like going and visiting clients. Like, yeah, and, and like set a team for distribution. So yeah, it's part of our end of 220, 21, 22, yeah, expansion mm -hmm. plan. So you mentioned, yeah, uh, what are your future plans for B-Beer? Yeah, like continue making new different beers, um, more collaborations, like start collaborating with more Spanish uh, brands. We start like selling out of, outside of Spain and it's been quite slow, but you, you sell stuff out of Spain and uh, distribution and of course more locations because that's how we start. That's how we keep connected to people and understand what, what people looking for. And, and yeah, at the end we, we, we are a mix of hospitality and craft brewers and we need, we want to keep that. So you're primarily a tap room or do you have food? Do you serve food as well as a restaurant? Yeah. Like in this location, it's a basically beer and craft cheeses. So we don't have a kitchen mm -hmm. in the new place. We do have a pizza ovens. We do like snacking. It's really nice. Like we try, we do pairings with more elaborated food. Yeah. And what's uh, what state are you in right now in Madrid? Are you uh, can you, can people come in and enjoy a beer, or is it uh, is it still locked down? I have no idea. No, actually, yes, actually, people can like get in. People, they, what I'm not allowed to use is bars. You know, like the physical bar. Yeah. And I'm supposed like to not surpass fifty percent of the capacity. Hmm. Okay, so, that, so, so that's 50% capacity for the restaurant or, or beer or, bra, or bar, I should say. Yeah, Yeah, actually, yeah, it's limited, but I, it helped us survive. Hmm. You know, that was better than lockdown. So what are, uh, what are some of the big lessons you can pass on to brewers, both from your time at the large brewery uh, in Venezuela and your time running a small craft brewery? Well, I think one of the first things is keep connect connected to clients to cons consumers because yeah that's where that's the business about then of course keep connected to the beer itself sometimes people get blind about what they're brewing and they like stubborn about what they're brewing and i i get it, it like in a huge brewery it's more difficult to change what you're brewing it's gonna take time it's gonna take like uh, explaining to the client what you're trying to do. But in a craft brewery, it's really fast. You can change really fast from one thing to another. So keep connected to your clients. Like, don't, don't forget that. Don't get into the brewery, like, in a routine that doesn't let you go out and see people drinking your beer, you know? Mm -hmm. What are your uh, most popular beers? Well, Coronel Mostaza, I think it's the uh, most popular. It's like, yeah, the our RPA, the what well, we have uh, more IPAs, but that's the one we started with. Um, the Captain Pistachio, which is a pistachio with uh, stout with pistachio and salt. Mm -hmm. People ask for that a lot. And there's one that uh, it's really like, I think it's the most different recipe we have is the Kraft Dogs, which is a brown ale, spicy and smoked. Mm. And that's like really, really different experience. We thought like it was really small niche beer and we have people like asking like brew that again, brew that again, brew that again. Like, yeah, it's been really, really nice. And uh, yeah, obviously uh, the country is mostly lager drinkers. How do some of the people react when they come in and try these uh, unique or exotic beers? Well, they, they, there's one thing that's really interesting here in Spain. They're used to lagers but they have Belgium really close. 
Right. And they do know about Belgian beer, a, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know why they were like so separate, like craft beer and Belgian beer. And but they, of course, they offer like a great step towards IPAs and other and different beers. And and that's the thing, like, hey, you already know, you you already try different beers, and. I think it's not that hard. One of the things mm -hmm. we do in our bars, it, okay, we have the flag, which is class, uh, like standard in the States. Mm -hmm. and But we also give them whatever they want to try first, like a, a little glass, like, hey, you want to try a little bit of this, try it, and then decide. We don't we don't try to make the sale at first, you know? So it is interesting. They are yeah, So they're, they're more closely aligned with Belgian beers as opposed to, say, German beers or English beers or, or some other style? Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. They know, they like a bunch of them, they already try Lambics. They already try Dubles, Triples. They love, like, yeah, Triple Carmelite or West Malle, like Trappist beers. They know a lot about them. Yeah. Even more than German and, and English beer, yeah. Um, well, I wanted to get your closing thoughts on, on your experience, uh, again, both as a large brewer and a small brewer. Well, I, I, I think they complement each other, sort of, or, or in, in my experience, I had to complement them. I was behind the beer for a lot of years and without now knowing how to tap a keg. And now I'm being in front, you know, of the bar, like serving beer, looking at people's faces and... You need both. You need planification. That's uh, my wife is really good at that, and she's really good into strategy. So we work a lot together, uh, like yeah, preparing the strategy for the next year. And you don't cut that part of the industry. You need to plan. You need to know your numbers. Don't start serving beer without knowing if you are pouring it right, putting it wrong, losing product. And, and the pricing, of course. That's a thing that usually in like the big beer, maybe someone else does it, right? You, mm -hmm. you Here you need to do it the entire uh, chain. Right, and obviously obviously, it's, it's much more profitable in a tap room than it is, you know, putting it in a bottle and shipping it off somewhere else, right? But That's, yeah. Yeah, of course, it is, but also the fixed costs are higher. Um, but yes, yes, of course. Um, it's more uh, time draining because mm -hmm. you need to be, you have the bars open every day until 1 a.m. So right. you have a, an excuse not to rest, never. So you need to be like really aware of that and try to to, to stop a little bit, right? Because yeah, it, 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 it can pay on you. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I think any small business owner works uh, quite a few hours, obviously. So yeah, and and being like right now, like working with my wife, it's make it like in that sense even more difficult because maybe we are having breakfast and uh, hey, why don't we do this or why don't we start doing that? And you start the day working without noticing, like as really fast. Yep, I understand. Uh, <laughs> hey, uh, so um. How can people find B Beer? Where are you located, and uh, where's your website? So we are in Madrid. We have two locations in Madrid Center. Uh, my, uh, our website, sorry, it's bbeer.es as being beer. Sorry, as honey bee beer. But I wanted to tell you about the naming. That's why I, I say being. Yeah, beer. no, go ahead. So yeah, the, our name B Beer. If you say like, if you listen phonetically in Spanish, is vivir, which is to live. Hmm. If you read it textually in Spanish, is beber, which is to drink. Interesting. Yeah, it also has the being beer connotation and the honey bee. Right. Uh, yeah. So it's the website is b as honey bee b beer dot es, and you can find us also on Instagram, which is b beer Madrid. And yeah, we, we you can, actually we send a couple of uh, T-shirts and, and pictures to the states last month for, for a client. Well, I'm hoping uh, hoping we can all get back to uh, to traveling again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and get the of tourism course. back up for you. That'd be great. 
Um, yeah, if so, you ever are here in Madrid, please like let me know and invite you a couple of beers. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I look forward to it. Um, so, uh, 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 Xavier, thank you again for coming on the show. Really appreciate you being here. No, thank you so much for having me here. I like a wonderful talk and I, I really love your show. So it's wonderful. Thank you so much. And today my guest was uh, Xavier Lasada. He worked for 11 years uh, at a very large brewery in Venezuela. And now he's the founder and co-owner of B Beer in Madrid. Thanks again. Thank you, Brad. A big thank you to Xavier Lasada for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They offer access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And also the Brew Commander, the new brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and gas propane models. The patent pending Brew Commander is a high quality brew house controller that offers automated step mashing, boil timers, precision temper control, and advanced settings. Command your brew day with a new brew commander. To order yours today, visit BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. Finally, I'm happy to say the new web-based version of Beersmith is available now at BeersmithRecipes.com. Beersmith for the web lets you brew, edit, and create recipes for any browser, including your desktop, tablet, or mobile device. You can try Beersmith Web for 30 days for free by setting up an account at BeersmithRecipes.com. If you purchase a gold, platinum, or pro license, you get both Beersmith Web and the desktop version for one low price. Go to BeersmithRecipes.com to give Beersmith Web a try. I'd like to thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm-hmm.